Beautiful, thank you. God is with us. Good morning and welcome to First Church of Christ in Simsbury. I am Pastor George Harris. I'm joined, as I so often, almost always am, by my dear colleague and friend, Rev Kev, Reverend Kevin Weichel, Maestro Mark Mercier, Jim Martoccio, thank you for that, beautiful. Uh, Tom Palizzi. I, We've said now goodbye to Tom Palizzi um, two Sundays in a row, and yet, yet, there he is. <laughs> Somehow there's like a Schrodinger's cat reference there or something. Is he gone? Is he still here? We don't really know, but um, uh, he will be with us for a few more Sundays before he really makes his full transition to his, um, his new work and his new, his new life. Um, we are an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ. Uh, that means uh, we seek to be intentional in our welcome of all people. This is, uh, June is known as Pride Month. Um, that is one of the things that we embrace is a welcome of LGBTQ uh, people and, um, and everyone else for that matter. So we do our best to see you, know you, understand you, and minister to you just as God created you to be as a magnificent creation of the divine, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here at First Church. I especially welcome this morning the Hanson Basquet family uh, here for the baptism of Amelia, so welcome. I know there's uh, no doubt kind of extended family and friends here, so if this is your first time visiting the church, uh, welcome, and I hope that you find uh, some value and meaning in your time with us this morning. A couple more things. Uh, we have a mask optional policy here. Uh, Rev. Kev and I have always interpreted that to be that we would be masked in uh, leading you in worship, uh, taking our masks off only when we speak. Uh, we just made an executive decision for ourselves this morning that this being the only place that we still wear masks is that we um, have, uh, is it doffed? Our masks, is that it? They're taking them off, you know, uh, Don and Doff. Um, uh, we've taken our masks off, and um, though we still encourage any who feel uh, most safe wearing a mask to please continue to do so. There are two traditions that help us mark the passage to summer in the church, and this year there's a third one. So one is... Mark and Jim playing summertime. Uh, so, so that's how one way we know it's summer is that we, we get to hear that beautiful rendition of summertime. The second is Vacation Bible School, which just happened this last week. And uh, it was thrilling to see so many church kids and volunteers there at VBS. And the third is a new one, and it's complaints about the temperature of the air conditioning in this space during worship. <laughs> so let me tell you this. Um, it is always set at 72 degrees, which seems like reasonable. We have learned that um, if we fiddle with it, then somebody's going to complain in the other direction, right? That it's too hot or too cold. So just know it'll always be set at 72 and dress accordingly. Um, you know, bring a sweater or be prepared to um, doff, <laughs> doff clothing if you need to. So um, uh, let us be together in prayer. Holy One, 
We come before you today full of hope, full of desire, full of promise. Help us take up the mantle of faith you have laid before us that we may use our own gifts of the Spirit to face the challenges before us. Help us face the turmoil within and around us that we may face the future unafraid. Show us your way, your truth, and your life. Amen. morning. Please stand in your heart or on your feet as you are able and join me in the call to worship. Throughout the ages, disciples have said, I will follow you wherever you go. Lord, give us the freedom to follow you in the ways of love. We come from busy homes filled with little time to consider Christ in our lives. Lord, give us the strength to follow you in ways of peace. In times of struggle, we look to God for help. Lord, give us the opportunity, opportunity to follow you in the ways of kindness. Today, we celebrate the Holy Spirit who shows us the joy of following God. Lord, give us the, the patience to follow you in the ways of faith. Amen. there are before we come up here so I, I miscounted but have, have a seat have a seat this morning we are delighted just thrilled for the baptism of Amelia Lynn Hansen Amelia is daughter to Jillian and Brandon and 
Yeah, and that is right. You are her brother. A very important role. Yes. This is this is Brady who has made himself known. Yes. <laughs> so uh, Jillian uh, was baptized and conf uh, confirmed here at First Church, uh, and she attended church school here and youth groups here as a teenager. Um, Brendan was raised in Massachusetts in, in the Catholic Church, um, and uh, he moved to Simsbury when he was 11, and they attended. Uh, Squadron Line School together in the sixth grade is when they first met, and, uh, and here they are. Uh, so uh, fast forward, eventually married, they, they live here in Simsbury, and they've joined First Church, they're raising their family here, they bring Amelia to be baptized today, uh, to have God's love and grace publicly acknowledged uh, in the midst of this good church and on her life. Bill? In the Gospel of Matthew, we find the story of people bringing children to Jesus in hopes that he might bless them. But the disciples rebuked the people for doing so. The disciples didn't think Jesus should be wasting his valuable time with lowly children. When Jesus heard what the disciples were doing, however, he was indignant and said to the disciples, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the realm of God. And Jesus took those children in his arms and blessed them. So this gospel story reminds us that the sacrament of baptism is an outward and invisible sign, a, a clear and visible sign of God's grace and God's love. Baptism with water and the Holy Spirit is a sign and the seal and participation in God's grace and forgiveness and mercy. And it's the mark of membership into the church universal and the beginning of growth into the Christian faith. This morning we celebrate that Amelia is God's child, filled with radiant possibility and deeply loved by God. So we have a few questions um, to ask of you. In bringing Amelia to be baptized, you confess your faith in God as made known to, in, and through Jesus Christ. If so, please say, we do. It's a birthday. <laughs> as her... As her parents, do you promise by God's grace to be Christ's disciples and to witness to the work and words of Jesus as best as you are able? As she grows in your midst, will you encourage her to do the same? If so, say, we do. Do you recognize Amelia as God's child created with her own individual worth? And do you promise to love her as an affirmation of this truth? If so, please say, we do. And when you look at Amelia, will you try to see in her all the children of the world, children of all races and nations, and when holding her, will you remember God's love for all people? If so, say, we will. And then do you promise, according to the grace given to you, to grow with Amelia in the Christian faith, to be a faithful member of the church by celebrating Christ's presence, resisting oppression and evil, and by making daily life choices that affirm God's love and justice for all, so that one day she may affirm and live out her baptism? If so, say, we will, with the help of God. Okay, hey, we're going to ask uh, Nick and, his, and Brady to come up. Do you want to pick Nick up? Uh, you want to pick Brady up? You want to help? All right. You want to help? Okay, I think that's good. How's that look? Nice job. Nice job, Uncle Nick. <laughs> All right, before we pray over the water, uh, Bill, have some questions for the congregation. So go ahead. And I invite the congregation to please stand. Do all of you who witness and celebrate this sacrament promise your love, support, and care for Amelia as she lives and grows in Christ? If so, please say, we promise our love, support, and care. We promise our love, support, and care. Please be seated. We remember this water that was poured and how meaningful it is. God's spirit moved over the waters of creation. John the Baptist baptized Jesus with water. Water means so many things, birth and death and cleansing and washing and forgiveness and life and growth. Water is both ordinary and also extraordinary. So, let us now be together in the spirit of prayer. 
Gracious and loving God, we ask you now to bless this water, that it might symbolize washing over Amelia your love, and your spirit, your goodness, and your truth. It's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. Okay. So, Amelia. Goes to you now. Okay. All right. Okay. We recall in one, in Psalm 139, the psalmist, the psalmist says that we are wonderfully and fearfully made. And this means that God has made us and knows us by name. So by what name? This child. Amelia Lynn Hansen. Amelia Lynn Hansen. I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amelia, the Holy Spirit be upon you, child of God, disciple of Christ, and member of Christ Church. Yes. Amen. You are a magnificent creature. <laughs> We're now going to sing, okay? I'm going to sing a song together. Want a little walk, too? So, um, you want to present the, the gifts? So, these are gifts from the congregation. And the first one is a candle that is made by the children of the church and represents Christ's life in Amelia, light in Amelia's life. There's also in here a beautiful, let me read this prayer that goes along with us. May God's grace be upon this baby blanket, warming, comforting, enfolding, and embracing. May this mantle be a safe haven, a sacred place of security and well-being. May the one who receives this blanket, Amelia, be cradled in love, hope, and kept in joy, graced with peace, and wrapped in love. Blessed be. Beautiful, huh? I'm going to put this right back in here. And the certificates also. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> okay. And let's close uh, with a prayer. We give you thanks, O Holy One, Mother and Father of us all, for Amelia, and for the grace acknowledged here today in her baptism. Grant us grace to receive, nurture, and befriend her as a new member of your church universal, and give to her strength for life's journey, courage in time of suffering, the joy of faith, the freedom of love, and the hope of new life. For Jesus' sake, amen. amen. It's hard to imagine looking at Amelia's um, purity and, and perfection, but uh, we all know that when we uh, by the time she reaches her terrible twos, and by the time we reach, by the time we reach this ripe old age, um, you know, uh, we've 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 made our share of mistakes. We, in fact, um, have sinned, and so it is, I believe, cleansing and helpful and opening and freeing to come together each Sunday and to share together this unison prayer of confession. So, if you would join me, please. Gracious Lord, you have blessed us with freedom. Freedom to follow, to turn away. Freedom to love or to hate. Freedom to heal or to hurt. You ask only that we follow your ways, loving our neighbors as ourselves. In the midst of our turbulent lives, help us find teachers to show us the gifts you set within us and help us claim these gifts today.
So I expect many of you can relate to the experience of when you've been wronged. Um, it's sometimes hard to let go of that, and we kind of get twisted around that and, and bound up with those feelings. Um, God doesn't. When we fall short, when we uh, act from our failures and our limitations and our sin, uh, God releases that. And that Holy Spirit of God just continues to move freely within us and around us always. And that is good news. That means that we are forgiven. You are forgiven. The scripture reading today can be found in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 15 and 16, and 19 through 21. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. 
when you arrive, you shall anoint Haziel as king over Aram. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and you shall anoint Elijah, son of Shaphat, of Abel Mehola, as prophet in your place. So he set out from there and found Elijah, son of Shaphat, who was plowing. There were 12 yoke of oxen ahead of him, and he was with the 12th. Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle over him. He left the oxen, ran after Elijah, and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. Then Elijah said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? He returned from following him, took the yoke of oxen, and slaughtered them. Using the equipment from the oxen, he boiled their flesh and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out and followed Elijah and became his servant. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Doctors use a scale of 1 to 10 to help determine a patient's level of pain. It's entirely subjective, dependent on the patient's own assessment, own self-reporting. Therapists use a similar tool to assess depression. I wonder how all of you would report your level of anxiety today on such a scale, or your fear, or your anger. I am thinking in particular of the impact current events are having on our psyche, which is not to say everyone hearing my voice this morning is maxing out on the anxiety, fear, anger scale. I don't doubt that some are happily oblivious to the daily drumbeat of bad news, or maybe feel like it's not really so bad after all. But I also know that for many of you, the volume on your emotions is maxed out at 11. I would like to offer a helpful response to such feelings, but there are challenges, right? Talking about particular public, public figures or issues in the news can often serve to further trigger those very emotions, anxiety, fear, and anger, regardless of where you might stand. If I say Biden, Trump, the Supreme Court, January 6th, gun legislation, abortion, I risk losing a cross-section of you to whatever I say next. Preachers can feel it in the room, a wariness, a clenching, a closing down. Which is why the Bible is so darn helpful. Because I can say, Elijah, Elisha, son of Shaphat, Hazael, Aram, Jehu, Nimshai, I can say worshiping Baal and anointing new kings, and rather than triggering anxiety, maybe I will pique your curiosity. Bible stories can serve as a helpful stand-in for current events that provide just enough distance from our lives that we might hear without completely amping up or shutting down. So let's give it a try. This is the shortest of stories in the Hebrew Bible, first book of Kings. 
Here Elijah, a prophet who lived nine centuries before Jesus was born, has been confronting King Ahab and his wife Jezebel for leading Israel in worshiping the Canaanite god Baal instead of Yahweh. As a result, Jezebel has threatened to kill Elijah, causing him to flee up Mount Horeb, where he encounters God. He cries out to God, I have done everything you have asked, confronting the people of Israel about worshiping Baal. But they don't give a hoot, and now the queen is trying to kill me. But God, Yahweh, is entirely unsympathetic, sending Elijah back down the mountain with instructions to replace the kings of Syria and Israel and anoint his own successor, Elisha. Replacing kings. Hearing this, we can only assume that things in Israel are falling apart. Elijah has said that the Israelites are rejecting their covenant with God. Instead of following Jewish law, they are embracing pagan practices. Talk about anxiety, fear, and anger. Israelites must be feeling it and then some. And we know that pain. This is what is known as a call story, a story in which someone is called by God to particular work in the world. Elijah is called by God to anoint new kings for Israel and Syria and to call his own successor. And Elisha then answers Elijah's call to follow. So not only can the Bible function as a safe stand-in for our own trials, helping us look at these without triggering still more anxiety, fear, and anger, scripture might also prompt us to ponder our response to such troubles, to ask what is God calling us to and how might we respond? Elijah finds Elisha plowing his fields with 12 yoke of oxen. Now a yoke holds two oxen together, right? So Elisha is driving 24 oxen. He is a wealthy man and someone that would have access to Israel's leaders. Now this is the opposite of Elijah, who is from the sticks, described elsewhere in 2 Kings as a hairy man with a leather belt around his waist, an ultimate outsider. So if Elijah, we might think of Elijah as being from the north end of Hartford, then Elisha is Simsbury's prophet. Note that Elijah does not follow God's call to anoint new kings of Syria and Israel. Elisha would fulfill Elijah's call to kingmaking sometime later. But here too, think about what a drastic measure that is, how bad things must be to replace the kings. One commentator calls it what it is, regime change. Before following Elijah, Elisha goes home, burns his plow, cooks the oxen, and serves his family a last meal. There is no turning back now. We discussed this text in Bible study this week, and Grantland Rogers had a helpful observation. It's this all or nothing aspect of biblical call stories that is most frightening and paralyzing. Grantlin is one of the most popular and successful teachers at Simsbury High. Surely he must feel called to teaching, I thought. Well, yes, and, he said. He shared that he has experienced other compelling calls in his life but has been unwilling or unable to burn his plow and slaughter his oxen. As well he should be. He is a husband and father with countless life and death responsibilities to others. But this is often the dilemma in responding to calls we experience. So what to do? Many are already overwhelmed by events seemingly beyond our control. And now God appears to be telling us to leave everything behind to take these world-changing challenges upon ourselves. Regime change? Really? Well, maybe not, at least not entirely. Remember, Elijah didn't anoint Hazael and Jehu. Despite God putting this call upon him, Elijah still made choices about what he could and couldn't do. I can do this, anoint my successor, but not that, regime change. Elijah decided that he would have to leave that for someone else, Elisha. 
It still got done. He just didn't have to do it all himself. I saw a great quote the other day. When God puts a calling on your life, she has already factored in your stupidity. <laughs> still cracks me up. <laughs> now, 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 stupidity is a strong word, I know. We might use limitations instead. When God puts a calling on your life, she has already factored in your limitations. God called Elijah to anoint new kings for Israel and Syria, but no doubt recognized his limitations and had factored this in. God knew the job would still get done. So even when it comes to God's call for us, maybe we don't have to do it all. Maybe we don't need to, like Elisha, leave everything behind. Maybe God has already factored in our limitations when calling us. I came upon a lovely reflection that was offered in response to this simple prompt. Excuse my, my mild language here, I think. Are we screwed, was the prompt. The writer responds, my honest view is that things are likely to get harder before they get better, and we still need to stick together. What is important in moments like these is not to think in binaries, good, bad, screwed, not screwed. There is no doubt that things are bad, some things really bad, and they may likely get worse. But that does not preclude the fact that slowly but surely, some good can be growing as other things fall apart. This is not some syrupy, sweet, silver lining case for optimism. Rather, it is about a choice all of us will have to make in life, either consciously or unconsciously. Will I be a person who is safe for others and creates good? Will I be a person who stands up? Will I be a person who primarily minds my business and serves myself or try to be part of something bigger? Or will I just be a passive, neutral observer of it all? What I sometimes tell my staff is that the world we are fighting for is already here. It exists in small spaces, places, and communities. We don't have to deal with the insurmountable burden of coming up with novel solutions to all the world's problems. Much of our work is about scaling existing solutions, many created by small, committed groups of people that others haven't seen or don't even know are around the corner. So while we can't change the world in a day, we can and do have the power to make our own world within our own four walls or our own blocks. We can grow from there with the faith that somewhere out there, everywhere, others are doing the same. And we will come together. That's why if you're a parent, how you parent matters. If you're a neighbor, how you are a neighbor matters. Many of our biggest problems are the result of massively scaled up isolation from others. That means many of our solutions can be found in creating community. Ultimately, we live in this world in this time. We have no choice but to engage in it while we're here. Even running away is a form of engagement. So will your engagement hurt or heal, build or bring down? There is no neutral choice, so we can at least do our best to make good ones and learn to do better the next day. You are allowed to be scared, to grieve, to be angry, but you are also allowed to create good, to be soft, and enjoy the small reprieves. Struggle lasts as long as we do. A response to God's call in our lives is present in each choice we make, within our four walls, as parents, on our block, with our neighbors. Now notice that Elisha does not respond directly to the voice of God. Elisha responds to a person, Elijah whose life and voice must have been compelling enough for him to change course and follow. Who around you, who around you is living a life? 
Who speaks with a voice that feels so compelling that you might choose to follow? I think of our member, Mark Scully, who after a career as an actuary pivoted and now is the full-time volunteer president of a nonprofit organization, PACE, which stands for People's Action for Clean Energy, working for clean, renewable energy across Connecticut. Now, I expect a few things can be said about Mark's response to God's call in his life. He didn't do it all at once, but one choice at a time within his four walls and in his community. And he didn't do it by himself. I know he was mentored by Judy and Lou Friedman, who died in 2016, leaving Mark to pick up their mantle and answer the call to lead Pace. They were his Elijah, he their Elisha. Mark has now built a supportive community of like-minded folks to transition Connecticut to clean energy. And Mark did this without abandoning his family and leaving himself destitute. I expect he took some risks, certainly sacrificed along the way by putting his call first in some decisions, but he was not reckless. He did not burn his plow and cook his oxen. I had coffee with Mark the other day, and as hard as he is working, he is genuinely hopeful and happy. And this is the thing about responding to God's call on your life, one step at a time, with others who share that call. When we do, we are less anxious, fearful, and angry, and more hopeful and happy. May you discern your call and respond that you too may know such hope and happiness. Amen. at the time in our worship where we share aloud our celebrations, our concerns. Today we celebrate, of course, uh, with the Hanson family on Amelia's baptism. We celebrate God's grace and God's love made known through her. We also celebrate um, 
Vacation Bible School that took place this past week. It was just such a wonderful time. I know that my kids had a, had a blast. They're playing the songs over and over again uh, in, in the house. Um, to Anna Harris and to Heather Trutka and to uh, Jody Swan at the Methodist Church, to all the volunteers from both churches, uh, we, we praise God for the collaboration, uh, the fun, and the meaningful experience uh, that was had by all who participated. Uh, we pray comfort and strength and healing for those who are sick or recovering from surgery or undergoing treatment, um, including Judy Rogers, uh, who's recovering from a fractured ankle. Uh, for Lori Lemoyne, as she continues her cancer journey, Marissa Campanetti, as she continues to recover from surgery and, and as she uh, is experiencing quite a quite amount of pain and um, they're holding off some chemo as they get that pain under control. Uh, for Abby Harris, as she continues treatment for brain cancer. Of course, for George and Lourdes, as they support her. For Karen Pilati, who had successful heart valve surgery last week and is awaiting the results of a biopsy. Uh, we thank God that she was able to return home and is up and about, but we pray continued strength, courage, and healing for her. For Bob Laban, who continues to progress in his rehab from severe leg infection, and for Pat Ketchabal, who is making good progress after surgery, still has a long road of recovery ahead. Pray for the Dioshenko family, uh, who sur uh, celebrated the life of Marge yesterday. Marge passed in November. The finally, family was finally able to gather yesterday. For John Ritson and the Ritson family on the passing of John's mother, Joan, um, we pray for the family as they uh, commend her body to the ground and her soul to God's safe keeping tomorrow at a graveside service at Simsbury Cemetery. For Diana Woodbury, uh, she has entered palliative care. And for the family of Kristen, uh, whose stepfather, grandfather uh, passed away, Kristen Wilder, her family is going through a whole lot right now with uh, quite a few losses and, and they're grieving. For our community and world, um, today we pray for women, uh, women who feel alone, hopeless, a prayer for pregnant women, single women, and a prayer uh, for, uh, for all life. We pray for more resources and support for women, families, and babies. Our flowers uh, this morning, uh, these flowers here um, are uh, representative uh, of the, uh, for the baptism for Amelia and um, they're given by Brennan and, and Jillian on the occasion of Amelia's baptism and in memory of Susan and Robert Palin, Palin um, so Brendan's parents who passed away. And also um, these flowers are uh, given by Anna Grupp in memory of her three brothers, uh, Oscar, George, and Albert, and Anna says, love always. What prayer celebrations do you have this day? Yes. for Anna's mother-in-law recently diagnosed with breast cancer. Prayers for her, thank you. Yes. Todd Williams will be 92 years old tomorrow. Well, tell him happy birthday for us, please. Wonderful news. Yes. For the Hahn family, Julia, open heart surgery tomorrow. Prayers for her strength healing. Thank you. Yes. Prayers for Paul, who's recovering from COVID. Prayers for Paul, recovering from COVID. Thank you for, for sharing. Yes, prayers for Paul. Prayers for all who are, who are navigating their way through COVID, and especially those um, with long COVID. Will the Lord be with you? And also with you. Loving God, we lift our celebrations and concerns, those spoken aloud, those offered in silence, those too deep for words. We offer them knowing that you receive them as you accept us with wide open arms. Holy One, we thank you for all creation. We thank you for this weather, especially over this past month, the beauty of your creation shining through. Thank you for this beautiful planet that we call home. We pray that we will do our best to be good stewards of all that you've given us. Peace, loving God, we pray for the places in our world where war is raging. We pray for peace. We pray for all the leaders of our world 
to use their powers of persuasion to work for justice and truth. We pray for all the innocent people affected by conflict, that they will be treated with compassion and respect. God, we thank you that you still love and care for us all, despite the many times we fail to serve you as we should. Help us to worship, honor, serve you without counting the cost or being distracted by the cares of the world. Kind and gentle God, we pray for all who are suffering today, for the refugee, for the homeless, pray especially for the people of Afghanistan following the earthquake there on Tuesday. Pray for the hungry. We pray for the women who feel alone and hopeless. Pray for resources to support them, to support women and babies. Loving God, we pray for all who are in pain, whether that is physical, emotion, emotional, mental, or spiritual. Draw close to those we have named aloud or in our hearts. Make them aware of your loving arms around them. As we leave here today, Holy One, help us to strive to serve you this week. Give us the strength to love our neighbors as ourselves and the self-control to make sure that all we say and do would be honoring you. We pray all of this in the name of the one who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Announcements. We have. Um, we'll, we'll skip through. We'll skip through that one. George did that last week. Uh, work is work is going on upstairs. <laughs> uh, women's ministries. The women's walked uh, Tuesday, 9 a.m. Uh, that is uh, an hour earlier than it has been because uh, of the warmer weather. Uh, they meet behind Fitzgerald's. So women. Uh, go ahead and, and walk on Tuesdays, 9 a.m. If you're if you're free. I know that that group really enjoys getting together. Um, also, women have a, a book a gathering on June 29th at Karen Cordner's home. You can read more about that uh, on the website. As we move along, uh, community outreach, the food chair truck is still uh, meeting here every other Tuesday. So <clears throat> meets over, uh, I'm sorry, Monday, thank you, every other Monday. And I know help is needed. And uh, you can see more information about that online as well. It's over at Boy Scout Hall. And it takes just an hour or an hour and a half of, of your time and come and, uh, and help to, uh, to hand out food to those who need it. Worship, you can also see, as we mentioned many times, that um, we are in need of lay readers uh, and acolytes. And uh, also, if, if you feel so moved to donate flowers on some weeks, you can feel free to, uh, to do that. So all of that information, if you go to our homepage, you can just look at weekly updates. You can see the weekly email right there, or you can uh, sign up to receive it uh, in your email inbox. We give God thanks for worship, for us gathered here, for the inspiring words that um, God spoke through Pastor George. We give God thanks for all the ways in which that this community reaches out in ministry. And in response, let us now give of our gifts and our offerings.
Gracious and loving God, not only do you call each of us to serve you, you call this church to a particular mission, uh, both to those gathered and in the community and in the world. So God, may these gifts uh, given humbly by us go in service to that call you have put upon us and this church. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I pray us out, I would just like you uh, take a moment to imagine that you've been a guest in someone's home and they've just served you a delicious meal. And one dish in particular was so delicious and so unique. And you just have to ask your host, what was that delicious crunch? And she says, crickets. <laughs> so I don't know if you noticed, but that reading I read as part of my sermon, I didn't in identify the author uh, who wrote it or who spoke it because I was concerned that it would, might have that cricket response uh, for some of you and um, cause you to go, ew. Um, it was Al Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, representative to the US House of Rep Representatives, uh, beloved by many, but considered a polarizing figure by others. And I shared the writing because, I don't know if you noticed, but there was not a, not a darn thing in there that took a side. And I recognize that it would apply equally to all of us here this morning. But I just uh, figured somebody would go home wondering, well, who, who did write that? Well, crickets. <laughs> May the spirit of the loving God mode, made known most fully to us in Jesus Christ go before you to show you the way, go above you to watch over you, Go behind you to nudge you into places you might not go by yourselves. Go beneath you to uphold and uplift you. Go beside you to be your strong and constant companion and dwell within you that you may know that you are never, ever alone and that you are loved, loved beyond your wildest imagination. And may the fire of God's blessing burn brightly upon you and within you today and always. Amen.